Yeah, so um, thanks so much. Uh, I want to first thank Scott Bennett, Nathan Gibbs, Matty Bucci, um, and the really, really everyone here at Point Nazarene, uh, Point Loma Nazarene University community for extending this really kind invitation. Uh, I really appreciate any opportunity to show work uh, that I do and especially to an engaged group of young people. It's really, really cool because it's not every day that we get to talk about the work, but also engage and hear where people are at. Um, I'm also really looking forward to seeing the student films. I've checked out a few of them. They're really cool this evening. And congrats to everyone who participated. How's this sound to everyone? Good? Okay, great. Um, thanks to everyone who participated. I know it takes a lot of guts to put your work out to the world. Uh, just to do it often takes a lot of guts. And so to enter the film contest and everything, it really is good. And I'm really thankful for being able to be a part of this. Um, I met Scott more than 10 years ago when I was working at the University of San Diego for a little while. And being back here, in the community of San Diego, um, meeting some old friends and new. It's really, really great. So today, um, today's talk, I am going to talk about family, diaspora, and migration stories. I may have gotten a little ambitious with my title, uh, but that is what we're doing. And as I was putting together this talk, I really saw the role of community in the lives of the people I've documented over the years and the place I've traveled both at home and abroad. And I began to think about what the idea of community meant and why it has been such an important theme in my work. Um, and I asked questions like, how do we find community? What makes up a strong community? Um, how do individual communities, especially migrant communities, underserved communities de build resilience, in the, obviously in the face of very challenging situations. And how do the answers to uh, these questions impact the dreams and hopes of migrants and people who leave their home in search of something hopefully better and new? Um, so, during my 30-year career, because I've been shooting for a long time, I started in college, um, I've worked all over the world covering a variety of issues that are often direct drivers for migration stories. War, you know, um, civil unrest, poverty, natural disasters. And I've often found myself in these places like Afghanistan, um, where I covered the first democratic elections. Um, and in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, I don't know if everyone remembers that in the room, but um, it was one of the worst earthquakes that killed, I believe, in excess of 200,000 people in one day. I watched that this lone woman uh, tried in vain to douse the fires of her stand in the Port-au-Prince um, Central Market. And, you know, she really knew that, like, she was all alone. But even in the midst of, like, just total and utter devastation, she was doing what she could. And she had this little bucket and she was just kind of trying to put out the flames so that her business could keep going. And um, this young man stopped to pose for a picture before picking up another ride. And even same day, the, the market was totally burning. But his spirit never dimmed. He was just like, take my picture. And I gave him a copy of it. And off he went. Actually, it was funny because he was talking about he had also worked for the New York Times at that point, driving the motorcycle, so he knew something about media. 
Um, but others realized they couldn't survive and took any ways necessary to get out of the city. They realized that perhaps, you know, you had to make a move. And so we've seen that time and again as life go goes on. This image is an image of a memorial covering the 40th anniversary of the 1973 coup in Chile when Pinochet uh, overthrew uh, Allende. And I saw that I went there with my brother, who was also a journalist, and we covered the story for uh, The New Yorker. And even four days, decades later, uh, we explored and saw the role that memory and the legacy of trauma played out in the people who were impacted by that time. And I was also surprised to see how many people really still love Pinochet. So I was, it was really kind of eye-opening in a lot of ways. But when we finally, one quick story about this, we interviewed a, a group of women whose kids had been um, killed and disappeared and they never found them. And they had never talked about it. And when we started talking about it, and this is 40 years later, it was like it was, had happened yesterday. That, you know, trauma and the um, memory stayed in them so strongly and had never been sort of dealt with. And I've seen that often in different circumstances. Um, and I've spent countless days and time on a special malaria ward um, in, for children in Mamaraya, Uganda, photographing a group of under-resourced but incredibly dedicated doctors and nurses carry out a study to see if inhaled nitric oxide could help diminish the impact of cerebral malaria in children. Oh, sorry. And I saw how women and children are the most impacted by poverty, and in particular, this terrible disease. But it was really cool to be able to see how the community um, came together and figured out ways to solve problems for their immediate community, because every one of these doctors and nurses had had malaria themselves, they knew people, they saw people dying all the time from it. So the ability to both try to find a solution to it that would help their friends, neighbors, family members, as well as the larger world, was really, really powerful. So I've traveled all over the world to tell these stories, and I, but I always come home. And I come home to Chicago. Um, I live in, between Chicago and Canada now, and I always come back. And I've always been struck by the power of photography to tell local stories that were just as important, that I came home, I would be back home, but I felt most strongly over time that my role was to focus on the injustices and the things that were happening just outside my front door, in my own neighborhood, in my country. And so often, especially when I started journalism, there was this idea that you were supposed to go somewhere else to tell these stories about a, um, other people. But in fact, I found that the things that I connected most deeply to often were right there um, in my community or outside my community or just right there. And so that realization really reinforced my um, commitment to telling these stories close to home. And additionally, like that was informed sometimes by being in places like Afghanistan where, you know, as much as I thought it was an important story and I was there to learn and try to communicate it, I also saw that there were a ton of journalists who were also telling that story. And I wanted to be in places where they weren't. And at a lot of the time, they weren't in the places that I went. 
um, which increasingly in the early 2000s was focusing on uh, the stories of migration. Um, so the work that I've dedicated, a good portion of my career, it began in Chicago. And I know that are, there are a lot of students here and wanted to tell you a little bit about how I work, how I engage directly with communities that are sometimes closed to outsiders, um, often for good reason. And I think being involved with the community and building trust requires showing up, demonstrating commitment to the issues and the individuals that are affecting people and the community, and giving back, both through your skills, but also in collaborative collaborative um, efforts, particularly, you know, helping people to tell their own stories in the ways that they want to, but also listening, you know, hearing and listening to what people have to say guides you often to the stories that are the most important and lets you understand what's actually happening. Um, so, this picture was taken um, at a day labor corner in 2000, uh, and I was working on a project called City 2000, and I just thought the interesting piece about this was we were making images that would resonate not just for the year 2000, but also be relevant and tell the world what, the, what Chicago looked like in the year 3000. So, over the years, I worked at a community newspaper. I taught English as a second language at the Centro de Educación y Cultura. I worked and taught at Chicago Public Schools where I coached basketball and taught photography. And all of these things gave me a better understanding of the city and of the United States and the world. These communities and the points where they interact and where sometimes they really don't. Um, and so this, like I said, this photo is really about these guys who would come every morning to look for work. They were, um, this particular corner was mostly um, Mexican folks and Latinos, and they just have to find a way, jump into a van, figure out a job every single day. And the police constantly harassed them for loitering as they made their way through to find work to survive, right? Feed their families, feed themselves send money home, whatever it was. And slowly they welcomed me into their community. So I photograph intimate moments of everyday people's lives, of people living in the shadows. And I've witnessed resilient individuals time and again in extremely challenging situations, constructing practical ways to improve their lives. These, I photographed these guys in 2007. I just found them because they were like walking around um, with a box for this guy trying to raise money for an operation. And so I, you know, I took a few pictures, talked to them, gave them a little money, and then like uh, kind of moved on to the next, you know, moment in the march. Um, but the picture kind of stuck with me because I was like, what, whatever happened to those guys, you know? Whatever happened to that guy? Did he get the operation? So when I started putting together the uh, Shadow Lives book in 2018, I was staring at the picture and I was like, God, how would I find it out? And I saw in there, I was like, oh, wait, the phone number's there. Maybe they haven't changed their number. And so I called them up and I spoke to Rogelio and he um, told me the whole story. And so it's kind of amazing. Like I think what's really interesting about telling these stories over a long period of time as you come back to images and to uh, the stories. And they actually, he told me a kind of bittersweet story uh, that um, I can summarize really quickly, but basically they raised thou you know, thousands of dollars that day, uh, went home and put the money in their house. And unfortunately, like a, someone in their house stole all the money. He stole the money, but he did end up surviving. Um, he got an operation and he returned home to Mexico. But the personal cost was really high 
But when we talk about like very like concrete solutions to solve problems, I would say this one was one that I really recall and is a good example. So on the day labor corner, you know, every day people show up and they get up and negotiate their fee through the window of a work van. Never really know what's going to happen. It's a very, um, uh, you know, jump in the car. You don't really know what you're going to go, what's going to happen to you, if you're going to get paid. Um, you just know you got to work, right? Um, and so I'd been following the story for a number of years, about three years, when this group <clears throat> of folks started uh, organizing to make a day labor worker center. So we were at a protest, you know, to bring attention to a news conference, et cetera. And a young man named Tomas came up to me and asked me to stay after the event. He said, you know, he, he wanted me to just stay. He didn't really tell me why, but he said, I, I soon found out. So he said, I want you to take a picture of me. <clears throat> so as he walked into the middle of this empty dirt lot that they were fighting to make a worker center in, um, he took off all his clothes, pointed to the sky and said, our bodies are all we have. And this remains one of my favorite pictures of the past 20 years. But, you know, and his words have stuck with me. But what the experience really taught me was that, like I said, trust is earned over time. Me showing up, not just for a day or for one event, but showing up time and again and having people see my face over and over again, showing the pictures, etc., cetera, um, is really the way that you prove your commitment and it's the way you build trust. And it's also the way people start to understand what you're truly about. Um, and it also taught me that uh, individuals really want agency over the stories they tell and how they're seen. So he told me, like, you know, he said, make this picture of me, right? And at the time, I was like, why is he asking that? What's what's so important, but, you know, he felt very strongly that this was the way that he wanted to be seen. Now, his friends kind of thought I was, uh, he was kind of crazy, but I thought he was actually really clear in his intention and how he wanted to be seen. Um, of course, as we know, labor is not just done by men, although the day labor corners are mostly men. Um, the Temporary worker center uh, agencies uh, are like really a lot of women work at these places. And so I was working um, on that and I met this woman, Guadalupe Lupe Guzman, while documenting the story. Um, she was organizing and fighting for, against the agencies who exploited her and her co workers in Chicago's back of the yards. And she helped to organize small-scale protests, sit-ins, and much more. We met, and she immediately invited me home to meet her family, and we've been in touch ever since. So Lupe brought me into the inner world of her family and showed me the true impact of migration. She introduced me to everyone in her extended family, Gabby, Juan, Conchik, Java. More than 75 different people and counted around that time in 2001, 2002, about 75 people had migrated within their two extended large families from Mexico. And her sister, Remedios, had married Anselmo, whose eight brothers, you know, eight of nine siblings had migrated from Mexico to Chicago. And this story is really a story of, you know, what migration means. I mean, right now we're seeing literally millions of people leaving from South America, Central America. But at the time, in the 90s, it was a lot of folks from Mexico coming, as have been coming and going back and forth for generations, but it was a big wave during that time. And so as families migrate, you know, I got kind of a first, like, firsthand view of, 
them, how the communities are transformed and changed by their, by their presence. And I felt like it was an honor, but it was also a rare to be able to access so intimately these quiet moments and the day-to-day lives of people who, you know, often are just closed world. So here, Remedios was counting $4,500 uh, to help bring family members uh, up to Chicago. And if you can imagine, uh, at that time, when we went to pick up Ken, uh, Cangrejo, Jose, uh, her, you know, Lupe's brother Zenon, and her in-law Roberto, uh, we got right to the gate at Midway Airport. There was no security, and there was a summer of 2000, right before uh, 9-11, uh, and it was like a year before 9-11, and there was no, there was no gates. You just went up, and we all went up. Sorry, I don't have that picture up. There we go. Sorry, that's it. Um, so, yeah, it was pre-9-11, and they actually flew. They crossed the border and then flew on a plane, got to Chicago, and uh, this is Lupe, and Chava on the left, and Chela, and um, everybody just really excited to see them because they're coming. This is them, um, you know, a few days later, taking a rest after work. And at that time, Lupe's family lived in the, like I said, the back of the yards, tight-knit Chicago neighborhood, where for more than 100 years, it's been a portal for recent immigrants, first from Europe and more recently from Latin America, um, called the outside world Gringolandia, where I was, where I was from. So like lots of generations moving to the back of the yards, the family and their fellow migrants did thankless, you know, hidden jobs that most people didn't want to do in the United States. A lot of people just didn't want to do them. Cleaning office buildings, preparing airline meals, uh, meat packing, demolitions, construction, a lot of stuff that, you know, just hard manual labor uh, for low exploitation wages. And, um, but on weekends, it's like everyone else, and they spend their time together. And, you know, birthday parties and barbecues. And let's think we do in Mexico. And the family relied very strongly on each other to, for their networks, for survival, um, to find work. Um, they would, if someone wanted to buy a uh, group, you know, a, a larger purchase, everybody would do something called a tanda, which is something that you do in Mexico, but also they brought that here. And so if you wanted to buy like a car, everybody would put in a hundred bucks a week at a certain amount of time. So it was really, and still is, the family still is quite tight knit. So I was sort of became part family photographer, part social worker, part comic relief. Um, this photograph certainly amused them at Jimmy's for Cuarenta Dias. And I remember every member of the church kind of razzing me as I took the photograph. Um, and they were asking when I'm going to have my own kid. It took me a lot longer, another 15 years or so. But over the years, I followed the migrant trail from the family's backyard, which is very local, like a mile from my house, all the way to Central America through Mexico. But I always came back to see these folks. And as I made my way further out onto the migrant trail, I began to see so many signs of xenophobia and racism and an ongoing cultural conversation that was becoming louder. A backlash was brewing. So on this one you see it says, white, beaners, KKK, each one kind of crossing out the other. And this was made in... This was in California. Um, and it was social, economic, political, and historic. The country was changing. 
um, yet again, and some people were not had a, happy about it. And if you can imagine, this was a number of years ago, um, you know, 2007, I believe. And in a lot of ways, so many things have changed, and in other ways, they haven't. And you could, that could probably have been 1908, right? So, or may, hopefully it won't be 2108, but it, this kind of fear, xenophobia that has taken hold and comes into the political spectrum is really, really kind of striking how it continues to be part of our society. But of course, migration is a completely human thing that has been happening for generations and time immemorial. It's kind of one of the most uh, human of acts. And I see it in, you know, a lot of different ways. But I've come to these stories through a variety of really grassroots connections. So I met Pedro, who's here, through Dar this guy Darwin, who was an 18-year-old uh, kid who was working in the day labor camp in Chicago that you guys kind of saw, the day labor you know, corner in Chicago that you guys just saw. And I said, yeah, I'm going to the border. He said, wow, can I get a ride? And off we went. And as you drive in a car, because we were going down to Dallas, you start to talk to the person. Uh, and Darwin told me, like, I told him what I was doing. He knew a little bit. He was like, what do you actually do? But, you know, when you're in a car for 12 or 14 hours, you start to get to know each other. And um, basically, I was like, yeah, well, I'm doing the story of migration. I'm going to the border. And he said, cool, I think I could help you. Uh, you know, um, my mom knows and my family knows some folks. Why don't we go to Texas instead of uh, Arizona? So when we got to Dallas, instead of dropping him off and me going to Arizona, and uh, we went straight down to the valley uh, to Reynosa, and we were looking for a red door, and this guy named Pedro in Reynosa in the middle of the night. But amazingly, we found him. And again, it's only kind of um, time, and just people have to look in your eyes. And so eventually, you know, Pedro basically um, accepted me and we went across and I photographed him crossing a group of migrants into the United States. <clears throat> Today, the migration is changing. Re the ways that people uh, come in are similar, but also different. But that, that night, um, we really, you know, I was able to show just a moment in, in his world. And that came from these direct connections through individuals who I built trust with. Uh, as you know, many migrants get deported from the United States. They end up in migrant shelters, um, actually along the whole migrant trail from Central America. Um, others, some people just need a place to go before they cross. But this was early morning prayer vigil at a migrant shelter in uh, Reynosa. And this flight was in Texas, bound for Guatemala. It was a deportation flight. And these flights, you know, like during George Bush, Barack Obama, and to this day, many people are deported every week. Um, but they're deported for a lot of different reasons. It could be anything as simple as like, getting pulled over for a taillight, you don't have papers, and then you're handed over to ICE. Or it could be you are actually um, have some criminal charges against you and are sent out of the country. But this getting access to this flight was a very different process because they didn't really want to let people in uh, to the actual flights. <clears throat> they go from these small regional airports. And so it's kind of unseen, like it's happening all the time but it's kind of just quietly sending people back to their, to their world. And obviously, once you're on the flight, once you're in custody, your life is irrevocably changed. 
If you're undocumented, you can buy a house, you can have a car, you can do a lot of things. But fundamentally, you are still in a, can be in a very, very tenuous situation. And so your whole world can change just by being pulled over. And um, I did a story f- uh, about this flight, and I, we hung out with some young, young men when we got back to Guatemala. And, um, you know, what people go into, uh, you know, again, you're thrown back into these situations that uh, can be extremely tough. Um, the reasons for migration have changed and evolved. In Guatemala, there was um, social violence. Central America, you know, corruption, impunity uh, have been a big driver for migration. Civil unrest, poverty, a lot of different reasons. But fundamentally, this story was about a guy, they were um, at a wake for another person who'd been killed. And then his six people were killed. And that's a brother hugging his dead brother on the street, which you can find right here in San Diego. You can find it in Chicago. You can find it in all parts of the United States, pretty much, as gun violence really racks people's lives. But um, I felt like it was important to cover the impact of, of violence and how it tears apart communities and does lead to um, having people want to go in search of something better. So just, you know, um, here migrants ride a cattle truck through the Paten jungle in northern Guatemala. We spent more than a week negotiating with the smugglers just to be able to take the picture. And definitely, definitely at that time, one of the riskiest situations I've been in. Um, and to bring it back here to San Diego, I was just talking with Scott a few, you know, like before we had, I haven't been down to Friendship Park in a while, but apparently the wall is getting even bigger and the fence is getting smaller and we don't seem to be learning that the lessons to address um, migration has to do with policy, not building higher fences because this year had the largest amount of migrants to the United States in history. So building a larger fence really is not obviously solving that issue. Um, So over the years, you know, as I say, I returned to see Lupe's family and would photograph them, you know, over time. I realized that their situation, you know, when I went, I would see kind of came back in 2016, 2017 to the family and their situation had changed a lot in the intervening years. When I was first photographing them, they had all just arrived. But by 2017, you know, it was like totally mixed status families. Some people had DACA, some people were American born citizens, some people were, um, you know, still undocumented, People have moved to the suburbs. And I finally, I was like, this is fascinating. I said, this is really important. And so I started photographing. And the kids who, like, I had known as little kids were now, you know, having parties and drinking. And everybody was together and growing up. And they had jobs and their own kids. And so I, I really felt like um, this was a really important thing to show. And I did make a movie, a short movie. My, my idea was really originally to make a film about this. And I did make a short film. But um, I pitched it to National Geographic. And I felt like, you know, this is a great story for people to learn about. Um, but they wanted the still pictures. So I did stills and a little film. And um, it was really, really uh, powerful. Um, so this is about the ongoing quest for the American dream, you know, about the slow and challenging road to assimilation and legal acceptance within the United States. And this, is, this photo, like I said, it's from a family celebration birthday party at Chava and Gabby's house uh, in the suburbs. 
Fourth of July. And this image I made of Lupe back in 2002. And at the time, she had been in the United States for less than five years. And two, days le two decades later, she's still here. Um, and she's assumed the role of the matriarch in the family because her mom remained in Mexico. Her mom is still alive, but she hasn't seen her mom in uh, 25 years because of the policy. She, if she goes home, she has to stay home, right? And so she's the oldest female member of her family living in the U.S. and is a fierce advocate, both for her own autonomy, but also for all her family members. I've never, very rarely met someone who's kind of just brave in the face of difficult situations and willing to speak up uh, to power and also to her fellow uh, community members uh, for a better situation. Often at great personal cost. And when she was doing the day labor organizing, she got blackballed by the um, you know, companies. So she started her own business. Um, and you know, a quarter century later, she doesn't have a clear path to citizenship here. So while she owns her own business, she remains vulnerable in many ways. And she recently turned 60, 63, managed to support herself She's buying a small plot of land in Mexico um, with the remittance she's sending home. But this phase of life, as she ages, as she starts to get into the more you know, elderly age, I think about what happens to folks who are undocumented. They don't have access to health care. Um, really, no retirement and no path to citizenship. So... How does that work for them and for our, you know, the communities in which people live? She's helped raise three generations of children, and um, she just has this amazing reserve of energy. But what about her, right? Like she's done all these things for other people, and especially for her immediate community, both her family community and the larger community in which she resides, both in Chicago and on the in Mexico. So I, I really do wonder about that. Last time I spoke to her the other day, she said, you know, she had, um, was thinking of going back home and was quite disillusioned. She couldn't get health care here in the U.S. The Mexican consulate wouldn't give her a matricula consulate because of a problem with a birth certificate that she couldn't work out in Mexico and um, because she can't go home. And so, like, it's been kind of a, Tough story, but at the same time, inspiring. This is uh, Chav and Gabby. That's her son. And Gabby, and Gabby also hadn't seen her mom in a long time. But they run a landscaping business and have found a way to move to the suburbs to a house. Um, and it's really the center where a lot of the family lives and comes and visits. But this view of Java always wanted a house like in the country, and so it's a dream, but they don't have potable water. So I find that challenging, but they're really progressing. And at the same time, um, what happens to them? So Gabby and Patsy cooking at home and, um, Basically, they're cooking barbecue there. So Gabby's done a little bit of everything to help the family run smoothly. And really, what I focused on in the story was how the women, you know, even from the beginning when I started photographing the story, the women really held up community. And so I, I really felt strongly that we should focus on that. From Lupe, Gabby, to other folks in her family. And so that's Patsy, like, uh, on the left side, that's Patsy in 2002. And then um, Betsa is on the right, little girl. And it was shortly after they arrived um, from Mexico. Um, today they're grown women navigating life in the U.S. 
I thought for sure there would be like some resolution at that time. I was like, there's going to be like some kind of uh, immigration accord that helps uh, give, especially the children um, who were brought here for childhood arrivals to the U.S., um, that they would have a path to citizenship. But um, it hasn't happened. And, you know, in, in 07 very, very close, and since then, Obama did DACA, but it has definitely been uh, a process that hasn't happened. But, you know, Patsy has DACA, so she's able to work, but, um, and, you know, she has two kids now, American or citizens, and basically, um, that's helped, but it's still kind of a bind. And this is going back when Gabby and Chava had Elizabeth and Elizabeth um, was their firstborn American daughter. So in 2002, I photographed the birth of her being born. And now she's like 22. Um, And it's crazy. So like, Time continues to go on, and the story and the community continues to grow a lot. This is when they came home, and that's uh, Elizabeth in the little bitty head, and that's Patsy and her other brothers, Jesus and uh, Java Jr. and Yasmin. Cousin. And then, like, this is Elizabeth in 2018, taking pictures with Betsa and Mari, who's the youngest. And so I just find that the, what I'm always impressed by is just, no matter what the larger conversation is in the world, the bottom line is people just keep on living, doing what they have to do to make their lives better. That's Elizabeth with her boyfriend, Ermit. And um, <clears throat> this was graduation day for Mari, who's the youngest, Mari, so the youngest daughter. She's graduating from high school. All of Chava and Gabby's kids graduated and Elizabeth and uh, Marisol are now in college. But this day, you know, Gabby kisses her daughter, Mari, shortly after her youngest daughter's graduation um, ceremony. By following this family and the larger issues that have gone on for more than a generation, I've seen how many of their small dreams have been fulfilled. And at the same time, for each member of the family, many of their hopes are dependent on their immigration status. So like, by not having clear, fair, equitable laws that kind of include people fully in the society, it definitely impacts people's worlds. As I said before, migration is one of the oldest and universal human acts. My dad migrated from Germany on a train, getting kicked out to avoid the Nazis. You know, we migrate for so many reasons. War, poverty, adventures, environmental change. I don't see that changing, but I do think that it's pretty obvious that our... uh, U.S. immigration policy needs to change. So if you guys have any questions, um, oh, sorry, there's a little bit more. Um, The project went into National Geographic, and this is an example of like part of this, sometimes to work out ideas and come up with different ways of thinking about the work that I do. I do scrapbooks, and this one in particular was trying to look at 
this back and forth, the emotional space and the, the time frame that had uh, gone on and the changes that I knew had been happening to life both in Mexico and to the family. And so I was just trying to find different ways, I like by grabbing Google Maps, historic images, pictures that I'd taken in the past, drawing, writing, etc. And I think that's really good. And what was cool is that when they did publish it in Nat Geo, I thought it was really cool because they allowed, they included some of this more experimental work that I do. I didn't show a lot, I didn't show a lot of the process stuff here, but it's really, really neat. And so they did that, and this is how the story ran. And um, San Diegan, original, you know, son, uh, Luis Alberto Urrea wrote the story. So that was a super huge honor for me because I've known him for years. And having him meet the family and be able to show the work really um, uh, was so cool. And his story was just really great. So this little piece of the story went in. It was about 30 pages. And some of the pictures you guys saw earlier were placed into it. That's Jesus on his wedding day. A little bit of uh, maps and some of the um, journals and uh, graduation day. Right before the day, graduation, actually, day before. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, it'd be great to hear from you guys. But I'm, I'm really thankful to everyone for showing up and coming and listening. And just love to hear have any questions and talk and have a conversation.